afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for the second MPOX briefing from Africa CDC. My name is Margaret Edwin. I will be moderating this session. Our main speaker for the session is Dr. Jean Kasea, the Director General of Africa CDC. I will now pass it over to him to introduce the ECG members who are also on this call. Over to you, DG. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to some of you. Excellencies, members of the media, dear colleagues, my African fellow citizens. Today, as announced by Director Margaret, who is our Director of Communication, we have Professor Salim Abdul Karim, who is the Chair of the Emergency Consultative Group of Africa CDC, who will be leading, co-leading this meeting with me. Africa CDC, we are led by evidence and by data. And we wanted the committee, that is the scientific committee with senior experts coming from Africa and coming from the world to provide guidance to the Data General Africa CDC if he needs or not to declare MPOX as public health emergency of continental security. I will then hand over to Professor Salim to give us a kind of summary of the meeting that the ECG had and the guidance they are providing to the Director General. Over to you, Professor Salim. What's, what's to be Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. As the Director General has just outlined, there is a committee that has been established to look at providing advice to the Director General on declaring a public health emergency of continental security. The committee called uh, uh, EC ECB for short, uh, comprises 20 scientists from each, four from each of the regions of Africa. We met as a group yesterday and in attendance were 16 of the 20 scientists. And in those discussions yesterday, we looked at all of the available epidemiological evidence to guide us in what is uh, the situation regarding the epidemiology, regarding the spread of the virus, and what is it we know about this virus and what the current situation is. We had presentations on the latest epidemiology, the number of cases, the growth and the evidence that we know in terms of transmission. We got some idea of the spread at a uh, level within the continent itself. And as we reflected on all of that, we had an extensive discussion and debate about what uh, uh, it meant or what this means for us as a continent. After quite a robust discussion, we looked at the evidence and we reflected on that evidence in relation to a set of criteria that had been developed by the African CDC. The criteria were very uh, helpful and very comprehensive. And so when we looked at it in relation to those criteria, we were able to pinpoint the areas that we most need to understand and to reflect on. I can summarize it along the following lines, that we essentially uh, provided 
nine points in our advice to the Africa CDC and the Director General. The first is that we understand the limitations of the available evidence and the available information that we have on the epidemiology in that the evidence we have on the number of cases, the number of deaths, they are just the tip of the iceberg. And the reason is that MPOX is largely a mild condition. We have limited surveillance. We have limited capacity to do the testing that's required. We have limited capacity to do the contact tracing and the reporting. So they are at multiple points in this. The information we have uh, reflects only a partial situation of what's actually happening. So that means that even though the situation and the evidence we had showed that the problem was quite severe, it's in reality probably even more so given the limitations we have. The second point we made is that very clearly that Africa is currently in a situation where there's a high burden of cases. There are far more cases now than there were when the WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern in 2022. In fact, if you look at the period, the most recent period, the number of cases in Africa is more than triple what it was uh, when the FIC was declared in 2022. So it's very clear that we are now dealing with a different situation, a situation where the, the cases are far more than we've seen in the past year and in the past two years. So we have a high burden of cases. The third point we made is that the number of cases being reported are increasing. What we have been seeing in the last few weeks is a rapid increase in the number of cases that are being reported. And this upward trend is quite concerning. So it's not just that we have a lot of cases, they are increasing in addition. The fourth point we made is that the case fatality rate, the proportion of diagnosed cases that go on to um, a negative outcome of death is at a level that we would consider uh, too high. And the current uh, case fatality rate ranges between 3 and 4%, depending on the period you take and the uh, criteria you use. And that's that's higher than we should expect from a condition like this, but we also understand the limitations in the data in doing this calculation. But our bigger concern is that there seems to be an association in the evidence we have between having immune deficiency due to HIV and a fatal outcome from MPOX. And if that's the case, we have to be particularly concerned in Africa because of the HIV burden that we have. So our concern is that we may be seeing more fatalities in Africa because of the association with HIV. So I'm going to go through very quickly the first four points we made. We said that we understand the limitations in the evidence. The second is we have a high burden of cases. The number of cases are increasing and we have a fatality rate, and we're concerned that that fatality rate might even increase because of the association with HIV. The next set of uh, recommendations or points we made dealt with the spread of this virus. And that is that we're now seeing new countries that haven't had cases in the last several months. They are now reporting cases, and that is a concern that we now have cross-border transmission and the virus is now moving into countries where it hadn't been before. And so that was a concern. And it doesn't seem to be the evidence we have does not seem to be that it's zoonotic transmission. In other words, from an animal reservoir, it seems to be almost all or mostly uh, from human to human transmission. So we are seeing new cases 
uh, in countries that didn't have cases before, and that's a concern. And we felt that there's a need for greater coordination of the response, that we need to ensure that the disparate attempts that are being made are brought together in an overarching plan with some coordination to improve the efficacy of our intervention measures. And so that was the sixth point we made. The seventh point we made is that while vaccine access is limited, we need to be circumspect because the vaccines are expensive and the benefits of the vaccine are not entirely clear in terms of general use of the vaccine. We have to be very strategic in who we use the limited number of vaccines on. And, you know, for example, healthcare workers have been one of the groups that have been at risk. And to approach it from the point of view of individuals who are at high level of exposure, for example, household contacts of people who are diagnosed with MPOX would be candidates for vaccines. We also have a real challenge, and that was the eighth point we made, that we do not have enough diagnostic capability. For example, in the DRC, many of the cases that are being reported are being reported clinically. We do not have um, a lab result on you know, over half of all the reported cases. So we need to do better in terms of making diagnostics available and making them available uh, so that we can implement public health measures. And the public health measures is case identification, contact tracing, isolation. Those elements by themselves can bring MPOX under control. And the final point we made, the ninth point, was that we encouraged the African CDC to develop a response plan in which we would be happy to review it and provide our own uh, uh, experiences and advice to assist the African CDC in its global response. So those are the nine points we made. And on the basis of that, the proposed resolution was then supported unanimously by all 16 of the uh, committee members, the ECG that were members who were present. And that was that we resolved unanimously to make a recommendation to the Director General of the Africa CDC to declare MPOX a public health emergency of continental security. And with that, I'll hand back to you, Luigi. Thank you so much, Professor Salim, on behalf of ECG members. Excellencies, colleagues, members of the media, and my fellow African citizens. Today, I stand before you with a heavy heart, but also with an unwavering resolve. We are meeting today because of the emergence and rapid spread of MBOX. This is not just another challenge. It's really a crisis that demands our collective action, a moment that calls upon the very essence of our humanity, our unity, and our strength. Our continent has seen many struggles. We have faced pandemics, various outbreaks, natural disasters, and conflict. Yet, through every adversity, we have risen, not as fragmented nations, but as one Africa resilient, resourceful, and resolute. Today, as we confront the threat of MPOX, we must summon that, the same spirit of solidarity. But let me be clear. This is not just an African issue. MPOX is a global threat, a menace that knows no boundaries, no race, no creed. 
It is a virus that exploits our vulnerabilities, preying on our weakest point. And it is in this moment of vulnerability that we must find our greatest strength and demonstrate that we are all learning from the COVID lesson and we are playing solidarity. Excellencies, colleagues, my African citizens. Article 3, paragraph E of the Africa, Africa CDC statute approved by African leaders in July 2022 is stating Africa CDC declares public health emergency of continental security in close consultation with affected member states and as appropriate relevant stakeholders. Africa CDC is the autonomous public health agency in Africa. And we bring together the scientific, strategic, and political aspect of our work. In Africa CDC, we are led by science and evidence for everything we are doing and decisions we are making. Therefore, we started consultations with several bodies in Africa and the world. At scientific and technical level, we had meetings with various bodies and people who are known as experts in the world. But these people, they are working pro bono and tirelessly for our continent. And the only way for me as Dato General to thank them is to recognize them officially. From the emergency consultative group, we have Professor Salim Abdul Karim, the chair, who just provide the summary of the meeting that they have. We have other professors and doctors like Ellen Ries, David Parire Niatwa, Lucille Bloomberg, Jean Jacques Mouyembe, Francine Toumi, Rose Lake. Rosleke Fonbank, Jean Nachega, Ab Amadou Sal, Tomori Oyewale, Sambaso, Dimi Ogoina, Marufi, Mawa El Rabat, Samia Menif, Faizi Dera, Sultani Matendeshero, Nelson Siwakambo, Claude Mambo Mouvoni, and Agnès Binagwao. Our African senior experts were also supported by other international and friends of Africa, like David Heyman, Francis Collins, Peter Piot, Dr. Sangotak, our European CDC colleagues, Mario Santos from Fiocruz in Brazil, and Jeremy Farah from WG. The ECG was not the only body that advised the Data General on technical issues. We also said, let us consult more. We consulted the PPPR Commission. This is the Pandemic Preparedness and Prevention Response. That is advising President Ramaphosa of South Africa as the African champion for pandemic preparedness, prevention, and response. Under this commission, we also have people working tirelessly for the continent, like Maa El Rabat, Amafeni, Senait Fiseya, Gitinji Gitai, Deni Mukwege, Abdraman Marufi, Sani Aliyu, Agnes Binagwao, Francine Tumi, and Amadou Sal and Salim Abdul Karim. In addition to these two strong technical bodies, Africa CDC is also what we call a governing structure, advisory and technical council. This advisory technical council had also a meeting and they made guidance that was also provided to the ECG for the appropriate guidance to the data general. I want also to recognize Eduardo Sado Gudo, Alex Oko, Anne-Marie 
Ambouret, Big Man, Patrick Amot, Romat Chilengi, Joseph Nianzi, Dionis Nzigi Yimana, Claude Mambo Mouvouni, Quinta Isumbo, Abdulmen Al Mash, Jean Akiana, Mohamed Ansour, Kadija uh, Youssouf, Rose Mwebaza, Adamu Issa, James Wabasha, Karim Tunkara, Francis Casolo, Thomas Mollet, and Marufi. All of these experts were joined also by others from National Public Health Institute, the meeting that we had with all of them to get a sense of urgency and also what they are doing to contain this outbreak. We thank all leaders of National Public Health Institute and Public Health Emergency Operation Centers from all African countries who attended various meetings that we had. We also had meetings with the private sector, including manufacturers of vaccine and diagnostics. But we didn't neglect youth movement and organizations. At technical level, these are all bodies that we consulted. But we didn't stop there. We went at strategic level. We had a meeting with what we call the Joint Emergency Action Plan. This is a mechanism putting together Africa CDC, the Director General of, uh, uh, the, the Regional Director of WHO Afro, the Regional Director of WHO EMRO, the Regional Director of UNICEF ESARO, Eastern and Southern Africa, the Regional Director of UNICEF WECARO, Western Central Africa, the Regional Director of UNICEF EMRO, supported also by their HQs. This meeting took place with resolutions made. We had also a meeting with the African Union Joint Sitting Committee that is representing all ambassadors on behalf of the Permanent Representative Committee. This is the meeting that facilitated to release the 10.4 million we shared with you last time. We had also a meeting with the governing board of Africa CDC under the leadership of the new Minister of Health of Zambia. This meeting was bringing together ministers, key partners, and the African Union Commissioner for Health, Humanitarian, and Social Affairs, my sister Minata. We also had many other engagement and meetings with various partners, including the Director General WHO, my brother, Dr. Tedros, the UNICEF Deputy Executive Directors, the Gavi, Global Fund, CEPI, Mastercard Foundation, Wellcome Trust, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, World Bank, Afrexim Bank, Africa Re, African Development Bank, and so many other partners. Then, after the technical level and the strategic level, we had also engagement at political level. We had meetings with ministers of affected countries and other countries at risk. We had a briefing to the chairperson of African Union Commission, His Excellency Musafaki. Then, we got also guidance from the president of Mauritania, who is the president of African Union, representing all head of states in Africa, His Excellency Mohamed Old Gazwani. From all of these consultations, at least 600 people were reached in various capacities to discuss data and evidence and to provide the way to move forward for this outbreak. Let me be clear and loud. Africa CDC didn't sit in its office and make a decision. No. It was a consult consultative process laid at various levels by capacity people. And as demonstrated by Professor Salim, MPOX has now crossed borders. 
affecting thousands across our continent. Families have been torn apart and the pain and suffering have touched every corner of our continent. Based on the consensus or even unanimity reached from various bodies and consultas, uh, consultations, as prescribed by Article 3, Paragraph E of the Africa Citizen Statute, today, Tuesday, 13 August 2024, I declare with a heavy heart, but with an, an, an unyielding commitment to our people, to our African citizen, we declare MBOX as public health emergency of continental security in Africa. Excellencies, colleagues, and my fellow African citizens, this declaration is not merely a formality. It's a clarion call to action. It's a recognition that we can no longer afford to be reactive. We must be proactive and aggressive in our effort to contain and eliminate this threat. This declaration aims to enhance the global response, mitigate the impact of the health threat, and protect public health while minimizing disruptions to travel and trade. Please let me be clear and loud. Africa CDC will never, at this moment, with the evidence that we have, advise for interruption of movement of people and goods. Movement of people and goods will continue as it was in the past while we are giving ourselves the tools to fight this outbreak. Article 3, paragraph F of the Africa CDC statute is giving Africa CDC the mandate to lead and coordinate the response when there is a declaration of a public health emergency of international concern or public health emergency of pub, uh, public health emergency of continental security in Africa. Please let me read this paragraph F. Coordinate and support member states in health emergencies response, particularly those which have been declared public health emergency of continental security or public health emergency of international concern emergencies, as well as health promotion and disease prevention through health system strengthening by addressing communicable and non-communicable diseases, environmental health and neglected tropical disease. End of the quote. During the consultation process, Africans and Friends of Africa clearly shared with us the way they were proud to see a strong and capable African body taking the lead for this outbreak and protecting African population. We're also clearly requested to work together and coordinate support from other key partners like WHO, UNICEF, by and multilateral co cooperation, private sector, philanthropies, and academia. We declare today this public health emergency of continental security to mobilize our institutions, our collective will, and our resources to act swiftly and decisively. It empowers us to forge new partnerships, to strengthen our health systems, to educate our communities, and to deliver life-saving interventions where they are needed. But this declaration alone is not enough. Words must not be matched with deeds. And today, I commit to you that Africa CDC will lead this fight with every resources at our disposal. Together with our partners, we'll deploy experts, bolster our laboratories, support the community 
engagement, and enhance in-country and cross-border surveillance systems. We'll work with government, international partners, and local communities to ensure that every African from the bustling cities to the remote area is protected. We'll also prioritize the equitable distribution of vaccines, treatment, and protective measures. No one should be left beyond, regardless of the economic, socioeconomic status, their location, and any other circumstances. This is a fight for all Africans, and we'll fight it together. To our member state, we call upon our leaders to give us the opportunity to better support people who are affected. From the bottom of our heart, we thank President Lorenzo from Angola for the negotiation that he led for the ceasefire in the eastern part of the DRC, where the outbreak is circulating heavily between DRC, Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda. We also thank President Chisekedi from DRC and President Kagame from Rwanda for accepting the ceasefire and we remain available under the leadership to work and provide necessary support to people who are affected in this area. To our global partners, we call upon you to stand with us in this critical hour. Africa has long been a front line in the battle against infectious diseases. And we have often borne borne this burden with limited resources. But the fight against MPOX requires a global response. We need your support. We need your expertise. We need your solidarity. The world cannot afford to turn a blind eye to this crisis. From May 2022 to July 2023, MPOX was declared public health emergency of international concern by WHO. But Africa didn't get appropriate support. And when this declaration ended, cases in Africa continue to increase. And today we are facing a consequence of non-assistance and not appropriate assistance to African countries when the public health emergency of international concern was declared. We call upon our international partners to take this NPOX as an opportunity to act differently and to work closely with Africa CDC and African countries to provide appropriate support to affected people. To my fellow Africans, I say this, the road ahead will be difficult for all of us, but we are not strangers to hardship. We have faced Ebola. We have faced the devastation of HIV. We have faced the threat of COVID. In each of these battles, we have emerged stronger, more unified, and more determined for our future. And books will not be different. In the next two weeks, Africa CDC working together with all partners in one coordination mechanism that we decided to put in place will be able to finalize a joint response plan coming from all national country plans that will be submitted to the emergency committee uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, the ECG for review. Today, I have signed a, an agreement, Africa CDC, European Union Health Emergency Preparedness and Response called ERA, and Bavarian Nordic for the procurement and rapid distribution of 200,000 doses in Africa. I call upon member states to fast track the emergency authorization of MPOX that will play a critical role in safeguarding public health and ensuring rapid access to life-saving interventions. By fast-tracking vaccine approvals 
while maintaining strict safety protocols, regulatory bodies can play a crucial role in addressing urgent health needs and mitigating the effect of health emergencies. This can significantly shorten the timeline for vaccine deployment, enabling healthcare systems to respond more effectively to emerging threats. In doing so, member states also contribute to a coordinated continental response, ensuring that vaccines reach those who need them most, and ultimately ensuring that no one is left behind. Excellencies, my fellow African citizens, we must act now with urgency and purpose. Protect yourselves and protect your loved ones. Follow the guidance of health authorities in your respective countries. Support one another, especially the most vulnerable among us. Together, we can turn the tide of this crisis. In face of this outbreak, Africa, as in the past, has always found its strength in unity. Today, we must draw upon that strength once more. We must stand together, government, institutions, communities, and individuals as one continent, one people, united in our resolve to overcome this threat. Mpox may have taken us by surprise, but it will not defeat us. Together, we'll rise above this challenge. Together, we'll protect our people, our future, and our continent. Let history remember this day not as the day we were overcome by fear, but as the day we chose to fight back with courage, with compassion, and with unbreakable spirit. Africa, the fight begins now, and together we'll prevail. Thank you. Thank you, DG. For, for, for your opening statement. Uh, we're moving on to questions from the journalists. John Cohen, I can see your hand, you have the floor. Thank you for doing this. With, with 200,000 doses and a two dose vaccine, that's 100,000 people for the continent. It's not a lot of vaccine. How do you target that? Do you and with HIV, people living with HIV being extremely vulnerable, how do you suggest countries distribute vaccine? How do you as Africa CDC overseeing those 200,000 doses determine which countries get them? It's, it's unclear to me how you do this. Thank you, John. We'll take one more before the DG can respond. Janice? You can come in, you have the floor. Hi, um, thanks for thanks for um, taking the call. Um, I just wanted to, I know, I know you've already touched on this, but um, just to circle back to um, the risk of border controls and the consequences of that, you know, triggering trade and travel restrictions. Um, what what concerns do you have around that? And have you got any projections of what might happen on that front? Thank you, Janice. Over to you, Didi. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Janice. Let me be clear and loud. No one in Africa will be left beyond if vaccine is needed. We start today with 200,000 doses. The priority will be with countries affected seriously and with countries with a vaccination plan. And we, the Africa CDC team already started to work with our countries. As I said, in the next two weeks, we'll finalize all plans and we can also distribute 
vaccines accordingly. But 200,000 is not enough. We need more than 10 million doses. Please let me remind you that Mpox is also a zoonotic disease. Let me remind you, the epidemiology of Mpox is changing. We don't have full understanding of what's happening with Mpox. This is one of the concerns that we have. It means we need a long-term plan in terms of vaccination. I will tell you today that we have a clear plan to secure more than 10 million doses in Africa, starting with 23 million doses in 2024. Because every week I will have press conference with you, I will provide more details. But I'm telling you with 100% confidence that 10 million doses at least will be available for African countries. We are working tirelessly with all of our partners and we thank some manufacturers for the discussions that we have and we will make sure that vaccines will reach each country, each community, each person who needs vaccine. Regarding the cross-border activities, Africa CDC is clear and loud. There is no reason to close borders. There is no reason to stop trading. The only reason we have by declaring this public health emergency of continental security is to ensure that we have tools. It means we have vaccines, we have diagnostics, we reinforce our surveillance in country and cross border to ensure that no country is importing disease and no country is exporting disease. And also, we are reinforcing the community engagement and the risk communication to ensure that our people know what they must do. If we apply these measures, there is no reason to, grow, to, to close borders. And we are clear on that. We'll continue to repeat that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next two questions. Janine, you can come in. Janine, can you hear me? Janine, are you with us? All right, let's move on to the next uh, person. Paul, you can come in. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Paul Adepoju. And my question is looking at the data that you shared with us last week, um, has the trend changed significantly between last week and this week? And I also have a question on why we are just doing this in August when the trajectory for this year started in March. What, how would you respond to this? That are we doing this early enough, or you waited? We waited this far before we started this action. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Esther, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, my name is Esther Nakazi from Kampala, Uganda. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, according to the data from the WHO and from the Africa CDC, Burundi's cases are increasing rapidly. Apart from the fact that Burundi is in close, close proximity with DRC, just as we are here in Uganda, is there a reason that they have many cases coming up and is there a case of underreporting in any in any way? Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Didi. 
Yes, uh, we are a team. Uh, I will uh, hand over to uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ngashi, Nikez, and Merawi for some of the answers, even to Professor Salim for uh, uh, some answers. But just to say quickly, uh, we, we saw the increase of cases, not only in March. I think there is a slide we need to share with you for you to understand where we came from uh, and when we are talking, what it means exactly. Uh, I know my team doesn't like it, but me, I'm more a scientific. I uh, will, with your permission, director, to share this slide for people to understand what we are talking about when we say uh, we talk about this outbreak. Colleagues, you can see in this screen uh, from January 2022 to, to date. This period highlighted here in purple is when WHO declared public health emergency of international concern. You will see that after the May, June 2023, please see the trend of cases in Africa, except end of uh, 2023 when we saw a decrease, but mostly number of cases were either at the same level or more, till when we started to record more cases from uh, 2024. This is why we are saying clearly, if we got support in Africa, when we had this public health emergency of international concern, if we got vaccines, because vaccine was available, if we got diagnostics, because diagnostics were available, if we got strong support on surveillance, cross-border and income surveillance, because everything is available, the figure in Africa would not be like that. This is why you will see me coming strongly and calling our partners now, it's time for solidarity. But let me hand over to my colleagues for uh, other answers regarding if data changed from last week to date, and also the Burundi case. Over to you, Dr. Ngashi Merawi Nikes. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, DG, and, and thanks to, to, to colleagues for excellent questions. I found the question of data uh, in the last uh, one week, I think the number of cases has increased by over 2,000. I think that have been added, 2,000 cases. Uh, but the number of countries affected uh, remains at uh, 13 that are affected so far. And then the second question on, uh, on Burundi. Uh, Burundi, so far, we have uh, 22 districts out of 48 that have reported. Uh, the issue of the weakness of surveillance is uh, a, is an issue that affects uh, Burundi as uh, other African countries. There is gross underreporting. Uh, there is a low testing rate. There is low contact tracing, which means that uh, the number of cases that we see are less than a half of uh, of the number of cases that are expected. I think it is one of the priorities of uh, Africa's CDC to these countries. Thanks, DJ, and over to you. Thank you very much. Let's take the next two questions. Bibi, you have the floor. Bibi, can you hear us? Okay, let's move on to the next person. Karim, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. This Africa CDC. Um, hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, as I'm coming from, I'm calling from Uganda. As of second day, August two twenty four, we see that uh, six mpox cases have been confirmed in three of the health districts here in Uganda. Uh, we found 
uh, okay. I see genomic screening analysis. So, sorry, Karim, uh, you're cutting two, off. Clade 2 MP. Yes, my question goes to. to Sorry, Karim, we can't hear you. We can't, Karim, we can't hear you very well. About Kukonar. So I would like to question. Hello. We can't hear Karim very well. Let's move on to the next person and we'll come back to Karim. Jessica, you have the floor. Jessica, can you hear us? Let's move on uh, to the next person. Rumbi, if you can hear us, you have the floor. Um, thank you. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, my name is Rumbi. I'm a reporter with DevEx. Um, I wanted to ask about the coordination with WHO. As um, you indicated, DG, this is the first time that um, Africa CDC is declaring a public health, um, a continental health emergency. And WHO is also in talks to declare this an international emergency. So I wanted to understand what the coordination will be like with WHO if both agencies declare an emergency and what role will each agency play. And then with regards to the last fake, as you indicated, cases were still rising in Africa when um, it was declared over. Do you think WHO was too quick to declare it over? To you, DG. I think you, uh, I didn't get the name because I think uh, there was some uh, uh, connection issue, but I understood it, our colleague from uh, uh, DevEx. Yes, uh, we are working closely with WHO. And uh, as I said uh, last time, uh, we cannot respond to this outbreak alone. We need to work with all of our partners. The way to see it is to consider the role of WHO at global level is to coordinate the response. And this is, uh, if you can remember, the role WHO was playing to uh, support countries to finalize the pandemic agreement. At continental level, the role to coordinate member states and partners for health issues is the Africa CDC role. And uh, I was saying, I thank the WHO Data General because we had so many meetings and this one is clear from each uh, 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 side. Now, what we are declaring today can be complemented by the action WHO can take. Because don't forget that MPOX was public health emergency of international concern a few months ago. We are talking about a period of May 2022 to June, July 2023. And we can also say we can still have cases in other continents. This is why WHO can decide to take a proactive decision to say they can, if this is the case, declare a public health emergency of international concern following the protocol that they have. But if this declaration is made, it will complement what we'll do because it will not change the way in Africa will coordinate the response. You saw the article. Three, paragraph F of Africa CDC started saying, if there is a public health emergency of international concern, it means declared by WHO, or public emergency of continental security declared by Africa CDC, it's the role of Africa CDC to coordinate the response at continental level. And this is what we are doing by looking for vaccine, 
by reinforcing our capacity for testing, by reinforcing our surveillance mechanism, by being led by our scientists like the uh, uh, ECG and other bodies I shared with you, they will be monitoring the progress we'll be making. And we'll be working together with all partners. We know the important role of UNICEF. We know the important role of MSF and so other partners. I think we are complementary on the way we are acting and will continue uh, this strategic dialogue with WHO, UNICEF and all partners. Thank you, DG. Let's take the next two questions. I have with me Rachel. You can come in. You have the floor. Rachel, can you hear us? All right, let's move on to the next person. Amanda, you have the floor. Amanda, can you hear us? All right, the next person, Jonathan Chapman, you have the floor. Jonathan, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, um, can I just ask the professor what role the lack of access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene play in the spread of MPOX? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the next question Amanda, if you can hear us, can you come in? Amanda, are you can you hear us? Okay, let's move on to Rachel Chelimo if you can hear us. Rachel, can you hear us? All right, let me just take one more from the uh, Q&A box. There's a question asking about uh, the declaration of the continental emergency. If this will trigger any formal mechanisms to increase funding, personnel, or other resources to support the outbreak, outbreak response efforts. TG, you can go ahead for the two questions. Yes, I will answer the last one and uh, regarding the role of water, sanitation, hygiene, uh, colleagues will also uh, provide answer. But I saw a question in French because we have so many Francophone countries affected. Maybe you also allow me to respond to that. Uh, the main reason we are declaring this public health emergency of continental security is, as I said in my statement, to bring our government, our institutions, and our partners together to look for all resources. Let me remind you, during the pandemic agreement negotiations, there was a section on financing, and we we're clear on that. We said, what will happen if there is a pandemic or a major outbreak that is declared, like today? Discussions that we had at that moment, it was clear to all of us that all resources that are available from all partners must support the response. We have a meeting with President Ramaphosa and uh, he will call a body because I want also to say it clearly, this response is led by the President of African Union on behalf of all countries. It means the President of Mauritania, supported by President Ramaphosa as the champion for pandemic preparedness, prevention and response by 
uh, President Moussafa, who is the chairperson of African Union, and the Secretariat is Africa CDC. Because we need countries also to bring resources. We need partners to bring resources, and we need everyone to be accountable. This is why this fight against this disease is not just a technical issue. It's a technical issue, a strategic issue, and a political issue for us to bring all resources. From the projection I see from the team, we will need around $4 billion to fight Mpox. We'll confirm this figure, but this is the broad one that we have. $4 billion will need all of us to come together. And we are confident that we can leverage resources. But let me hand over to the team for the question from Jonathan. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, DG, and thanks to Jonathan for that question about the role of WASH uh, you know, in the MPOX uh, outbreak response. Just to say, uh, because of the human-to-human -human contact transmission, uh, water and, and sanitation and hygiene is a, an important uh, component of the response and uh, a main pillar of the MPOX outbreak uh, response plan that we are working on as part of the uh, infection prevention and control, both at uh, household level, but also in the health facilities for the protection of the people at community level uh, with uh, personal hygiene and uh, availability of clean water. The same also in the health facility for the protection of healthcare workers with uh, the same personal hygiene and protection and also the availability of clean water. Uh, this is some, an area that we are working with uh, a number of partners, including UNICEF, that really have both the expertise and also uh, the resources that are being invested to cover the area of uh, water and sanitation. Over. Yes, uh, Dr. Margaret, please let me answer to this question in French coming from DRC. It's in the chat. La question est posée par Bibi Chambete. Quelles sont les implications de cette déclaration pour les populations concernées? Devraient-elles s'attendre à des mesures d'urgence, à des restrictions des mouvements? Je suis très clair là-dessus. Il n'y a ni restriction des mouvements des populations ou des marchandises. Cette déclaration nous permet maintenant de dire on stop, on ne continue plus comme on le faisait avant. La question qui nous avait été posée par notre sœur Esther de l'Ouganda était de savoir si on a vu, ou bien notre uh, Paul, si on a vu les changements dans le nombre de cas, la semaine passée. Et la semaine passée, c'était le jeudi qu'on a eu la réunion. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes mardi. De jeudi à mardi, on a 2000 cas suspects en plus. Et ça, ça vous montre en peu de jours combien l'épidémie continue à aller encore plus vite. J'étais en train de parler avec mon ami le ministre de la RDC, qui m'a clairement dit qu'il a pris la décision chaque lundi d'organiser des réunions de coordination sous son leadership, puisqu'il a senti que même les données officielles ne sont pas exactement la réalité de ce qui se passe quand il discute avec les gens des provinces. Nous pouvons nous attendre à deux, trois fois plus de cas que ceux qui sont rapportés aujourd'hui. Donc, les implications de cette déclaration, c'est d'abord pour nous donner tous les moyens de coordination, tous les moyens pour avoir 
une bonne communication, informer les gens. Les gens doivent connaître c'est quoi un pox, comment ça se transmet, comment on doit l'éviter. De trois, ça va nous donner les moyens de lutte, comme le vaccin. Ça coûte très cher, ce vaccin. Et donc, pour avoir ça, nous avons besoin de déclarer, d'avoir des ressources pour les acheter, mais aussi de faire des recherches. Les recherches sont importantes sur l'épidémiologie, comment ça change, sur les diagnostics, sur même les médicaments. Donc, il faut être très clair pour dire à nos populations des pays concernés, surtout des pays francophones, voilà pourquoi je l'ai fait en français, que cette déclaration doit être perçue comme une mesure salvatrice pour la population, comme une décision qui devait être prise à un moment donné afin que nous ne puissions plus être dans la même situation. Thank you, DG. I think uh, we are now uh, six minutes over time. We'll probably take the last uh, two questions and then we can close the session. Uh, so we have a question in the chat box about uh, the international partners. Uh, how are they doing a better job of responding to the public health emergency? than when WHO declared MPOX as an international emergency. Can you elaborate on the specific types of support and resources you'd like international partners to provide? That's a question from the chat box. Another one is uh, asking about uh, the term security that is being used when we talk about the health emergency of continental security. What does this mean? I think, DJ, you can take those two. Yeah, I will first start with Professor Salim because uh, he's leading also this uh, committee of our geeks. Uh, when our partners are coming to ask what they can provide from your point of view, Professor, and your team, what do you think can be your ask before I compliment you? Sure. I think the first thing is that um, we have to remember that when we're dealing with MPOX, we're dealing with a virus that spreads through the community at a very slow rate. And so there are many opportunities to interrupt the transmission because of the nature of the interaction between the person who is infected and the person who is susceptible. So for that reason, the principal strategies that are used to bring disease like this under control are public health measures. And those public health measures are first and foremost, you've got to focus on case detection. So you've got to try and find as many of the cases as possible. So that means public education, community education, health workers being alert to identifying cases and diagnosing them. And once identified where there's a suspicion, they need access to laboratory testing. So you need uh, uh, health workers and the public who are alert if they get symptoms or if they identify somebody or a patient who might be a suspicious uh, case that there's the opportunity to provide testing. And once you've identified a positive case, is then to do the contact tracing, to identify the chain of transmission, who this person likely got it from, and who this person may be spreading it to. And those become the key elements of the control. It's to break the chains of transmission. And you do that with those very simple, straightforward measures. So case detection, diagnosis, contact tracing, isolation of cases so they don't spread it to others, and ensuring that the public and the healthcare workers are highly aware of dealing with this problem. When you start talking about medical countermeasures, they add another level to this. They supplement public health measures. They don't replace public health measures. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Angashi, you want to ask, uh, provide some additional information? Dr. Angashi, I see your end. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. We, what we are saying to our partners, there are three levels of coordination. The first level of coordination is at country level. This one is laid by the minister. As I said, I was talking with my brother, the Minister of Rwanda yesterday, the way he can do that. I was talking with the Minister of DRC, the Minister of Côte d'Ivoire, of Congo, Brazza, and the other ministers. The first level, the minister is putting all entities together and all partners together, and there is one plan, the country plan. In this plan, they will identify based on the guidance that they are getting from Africa cities at continental level, what are areas of response that must be uh, there. At that level, partners can also provide support to countries directly or to partners working with these countries to respond to the outbreak. The second level of coordination is at continental level. At continental level, we already decided with WHO, with UNICEF, with all other partners to have one coordination mechanism that will be led by Africa CDC. And this coordination mechanism, the role is to assess on daily basis and weekly basis the progress that countries are making based on all areas that Professor was providing. The first one is risk communication and community engagement. The second one is human capacity. It means we need skilled human resources to support the response. The third one is medical countermeasures. It means vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics must be available. The fourth one is to reinforce the lab capacity and to reinforce the surveillance in country and cross-border surveillance. And also there is an aspect on studies to be conducted. This is why we need our universities, our center of excellence to come together because we need more clinical trials, we need more studies to understand this phenomenon. Based on all of these areas, we have some committees, meeting, technical working groups, and at continental level, we are assessing what's happening, what are gaps, where we can support, provide additional support. The third level is at international level with WHO. On daily basis, on weekly basis, we'll be providing also information to WHO on what we are doing in Africa for them also, to coordinate with other continents on effort to be done, especially if there is declaration of public health emergency of international concern. I think this is how we can approach uh, uh, that, and uh, we are very committed to do that job because this is why we are here. Thank you, DG. And with that, so we've come to the end of our press briefing today. Uh, we have a couple of one-on-one -on -one requests from journalists, which we will work on after the press briefing. I will now hand over to the DG to provide closing remarks. Over to you, DG. Excellencies, colleagues, African citizen, it's not a joy to declare a public health emergency of continental security. It's a responsibility. It's a responsibility because what we're doing before didn't work. It's now time for us to stop, to say we have scientists that are respected over the world, the Africans, 
Professor Salim clearly told us that when they met, I gave you names of these people. Most of them are sitting in various bodies with WHO and other respected organizations. But he told you, all of them came together to say, we want the DG to declare MPOX a public health emergency of contender security. It's a huge responsibility for all of us, not only for Africa CDC, not only for ECG, but for all of us, head of state, ministers, public health leaders, partners, and communities. This is time for us to come together and to say, let us, for the first time, really work together to mitigate the negative image of COVID in Africa. Because we know during COVID, we're left beyond. I can say, since we started to work on this inbox, I can feel solidarity coming from our partners. And I will just encourage them to continue like that. We commit first on a weekly basis to have the press conference and to update you number of cases, number of deaths, number of countries and regions affected. You will see our presentations will be mostly led by what's happening in each country. We'll also provide the effort done by countries and partners. We'll also promote our African scientists doing research and share what Africa is producing. We'll also share with you what we are getting from other continental partners. We commit also to have in the next two weeks a, an African joint action plan. It means a response plan that will combine the effort from all countries. And that will be shared with the emergency consultative group led by, by Professor Salim and also to the governing board of Africa CDC and to the permanent representative of African Union, it means our ambassadors in AU. Because we want all bodies to be together, the technical one, the strategic one, and the political one. After their feedback, we'll bring them to President Ramaphosa and President Gazwan for them to lead us on the best way we continue to respond to this outbreak. We believe that this collaboration that we are putting in place, countries, continent, and global level will help us strongly to mitigate the impact of this outbreak. We are also calling all of our partners. Many of you were thinking that a pandemic maybe will come later. If we don't pay attention, if we don't deal with NPOX as we need to do, we can be surprised. The question was not if we can have another pandemic. The question was when we can have another pandemic. With what we are seeing with MPOX, there are so many reasons for us to start to put in place strong mechanisms to mitigate that and to continue to be prepared. I will end my remarks by saying thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to our leaders in Africa. All of them, I wanted to reach out and to talk to them were available for us. I want to thank our scientists 
the ECG group, the ATC group advisory technical council, the PPPR commission, and all colleagues leading national public institutes, leading public health emergency operation centers, leading at hospital level, district level response. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank our partners and especially the private sector because they are working hard today to make sure that we'll have appropriate medical countermeasures, vaccines, diagnostics. As I said, I commit to you, we'll have vaccine. At least 10 million doses will be available. This one is the responsibility we are talking about. And we want you to continue to trust us and to support us. We'll create mechanism for a dialogue. I thank you and I hope member of media, please help us to share information to our population to say there is a captain on board and we'll win together. Thank you.